Welcome to this dot podcast. I'm your friendly host Jay, joined by my friends. We got Co. Man, what are we talking about? And we got Uncle Damo. <laughs> <laughs> The intro music you listen to right now is grinding, and that's what we do. We grinding, man. It's uh, I'm gonna let y'all in. This is take two. Jay forgot to turn on the recorder, so we're going at it again. But it's gonna be great content. You could catch clips on the same platforms that we're on. That's Amazon, Spotify, Apple, and you can get video on YouTube. Shout out to the incredible Lawrence and Larimer for providing the space. You can catch them on lawrenceandlarimer.com or you can go to 3225 East Koufax Avenue. Mm. And the reason why we're playing this music is because we represent in VA today. And we, uh, our special guest is from Hampton. He's from the bottom. Mm. And he made sure that we knew he was from the bottom, not the DMV. <laughs> now, nah, you know, we ain't talking about PG County. Now we're talking about the bottom in Hampton. All oh, right. And our women look good. And the women look great. Yeah. And without further ado, our, t- our special guest today is the founder and chief and editor of Denver Journal, Education and Community, and also associate dean of, uh, associate dean for equity, diversity, for, and inclusion for CU Denver, welcome Antoine Jefferson to the show. Thanks. Glad to have you, brother. This is take two. You was cooking too, man. You was chefing. Let me turn down clips. Y'all probably won't even get it because my man Damo said it's copyright infringement and he is correct. So, but I'm like, if we get that many views, then I think we're doing something right. <laughs> they were going to call YouTube and be like, uh, Jay, Jay, yeah, play. that's the kind of dude he is. Talk Kill to him, Co. No Jay was, content. Jay <laughs> content. Just so he can be right. Like, I told you. I told you. Uh, that's great. Hey, hey that's what's, that, funny. Hold on. What's, that, what's that little meme with that guy like this? Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> that man going to be snitching, huh? <laughs> going to have the sunglasses on on the phone. <laughs> oh, man. Y'all crazy. <laughs> Antoine, welcome to the show, brother. Thank you. And uh, we were talking about your journey and uh, where you're from. You're from Virginia Hampton, okay. right? Mm-hmm. And or Hampton, that, Virginia. Or Hampton, mm-hmm. Virginia. Mm-hmm. So um, thanks for that, Damo. Tell us about, you were telling us about your journey to Colorado. Yeah. And what that looked like, right? And you were saying you were married. You've been yeah. married for 20 years, but you met your wife in fifth grade. Yeah, you got a good memory. Yeah, that's right. Absolutely. Tell us about that. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, I shot my load already. <laughs> <laughs> you asking me to go twice yeah, in one night? Yeah, Come yeah, on, yeah. man. <laughs> I ain't in my 20s no more. <laughs> but tell us about your journey from VA out to Denver. Yeah, good. So uh, (laughs) I moved out here when I was 25. Uh, That's when I got married. Right. And I had decided, well, if we're going to be married, then let's 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 see what our own journey will be like. See if we actually like each other, because we didn't live together before we got married or anything like that. We were just we made the decision and this is where we decided to get started. And our plan originally was to be here for three to five years. And then moved back east because at that time I had a great grandmother who was born in uh, 1913. Mm. Um, in fact, she was 100 the year she passed away, mm. and that was the same year I defended my dissertation and got my doc. And so I wanted to move back to be closer to family at some point. The goal wasn't to be here in perpetuity; it was to be <laughs> here and lay a foundation, and uh, and then and then move back to where there are cities that. You know, on the East Coast, you drive three hours and you're always in a major city and black people are everywhere and there's black wealth and black finesse and like all of this really cool stuff. Mm -hmm. There's also a lot of suffering and struggle every three hours in all of those cities. Mm. And when I moved to Denver, it was to be here for a little while just to like lay a foundation. Right. Um, But after we got here and Dominique, that's my wife's name, felt like this place was right. And she likes stability and I like activity. 
And she wanted to be in the same place, especially after our son was born. He's 17 now. And uh, at that point, I think it became clear we're professionally stable. Mm -hmm. We had bought our first house within the first year that we moved here. And uh, I think I was probably the first homeowner in my immediate family Mm. for a couple of layers. And um, so I felt like I was getting stuff done. And one other thing I want to say is that part of the reason that I was interested in moving to Denver was my, my heart's dream was always to move to Atlanta, graduate college, graduate, move back to Atlanta and have a reason to be in that beautiful last city. But in order to be fair to Dominique and for both of us to be at ground zero, where we don't have any foundation, we have to create it on our own, it made more sense to move to a place where we both were foreigners. We both were new. We didn't have roots. That would be up to us. And if we move anywhere up and down the East Coast, West Coast, most of the South, there were lots of existing relationships where one of us would have a community and the other one would be on the outside looking in. And this way, it would be both of us at, at nothing, right? So that's how we got here. Uh, we haven't been able to leave for a lot of reasons. Home ownership. We have children, uh, 13 and 17. But also, every time, every time I go back to Atlanta, which is one of my favorite cities in the country, I go back for homecoming as often as I can. But I'm a different person than I was when I was at Morehouse when it was the most beautiful place for me to be. So now when I go back, I have to make adjustments because the person I am here, the way I communicate here, the way I live my life here, the energy I have here, the beliefs that I've developed, those things are not normal in a city like that. They're not normal in Virginia, shit. I, I eat kale and chicken. Do <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And I, I grew up eating. I'm not kidding. You, mean you, don't, you don't have the chicken wings with the mumbo sauce? You ain't getting none of that, man? It, <laughs> I eat seven things. My diet, my full diet consists of, my, my full regular diet consists of seven items. But I grew up eating chitlins and pig feet and scotch eggs. And, and greens. And greens. Talk about kale. Sometimes. Yeah. I didn't even if know you kale. you don't get that kale up shit out of here. Kale, I don't even think kale existed. Uh-huh. Until like seven years ago, uh-huh. I don't think That's I knew funny. about it. It was just like garnish. Kale chips. But my diet changed, my behavior changed. I started exercising. I run, I ride, I raft. Like I do all of this stuff that we didn't do growing up. So when I go back to the East Coast to visit my people, I always want to just come back to Virginia because then I feel, I mean, to Denver because then I feel like I'm at home. Mm. I feel like I can relax. And this, <clears throat> this city at the time that we moved here is different. From it, it was different from the way the city is now. Oh, yeah. And yeah. you all grew up here. I did not. But I've been here for 20 years. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's changed And in a lot. the 20 years that I've been here, when I first got here, when Dominique and I first got here, it, there was less bureaucracy. The city moved a lot differently. Communities were seen to be more intact. There was just less displacement. The day that we came in January of 2002, because we got married in July, we flew out to the Springs because I had an aunt who was stationed at Fort Carson. We drove up to, uh, to Denver. First time in the city, we had job interviews at 9 o'clock. We had to be at 900 Grant Street. And all we had to do was get on the elevator, go upstairs, and have an interview together. We got interviewed together. I got sent to Montbello. Dominique rode with me. I walked in that school and was like, this is the only place I want to be. Like, it felt that day we had – I had a job. Dominique's was on its way. We had an address – that same day because we found an apartment like things settled in eight hours that normally take months and months to do so it seemed like things were lining up when we got here wow nice. now if you've got to go through levels of security you can't get on the elevator without a badge you can't buy a home unless you make more than a hundred thousand dollars a year <laughs> people are gone that weren't here before that were here before it feels like a very different city but when we got here at 24 and 25 years old we were welcome and support it. There's, a, there's a, oh. a woman who taught in DPS, Denver Public Schools, for 42 years. Her name is Mary Sam. And we had our first day of training for Denver Public Schools new teacher orientation uh, or for the beginning of the school year. And, and Mrs. Sam had, had been teaching for decades. And she saw me in the hallway and she saw Dominique in the hallway the first day we got to the convention center or wherever this, the hotel, wherever this training was. And she was like, young man, come here. And I walked over and I said, yes, ma'am. And she said, who are you? And I told her who I was. She said, you know something? You look like my son. 
And then she asked me where I was going to be teaching. And I said, I'm going to be teaching at, at Montbello High School. And she said, my son is a student at Montbello High School. I want you to look for him when you get there. I'm going to tell him to look for you. He didn't look for me for a full year because he didn't want his mom in his business. But now he and I are like this. My kids right. call him Uncle Wally. He's a police officer for Denver. Um, but she welcomed me the first time she saw me. And her interaction with me and with Dominique and, uh, and so many other people immediately and over the years was, you are one of us. We welcome you. You're young, but we're going to look out for you and help you figure the city out. And it, it, was, it was just the, the right way to land in a place like this. And if I left it, I don't know what I'd be trading for. Yeah. So no, that's dope. Um, on, on part one, <laughs> you talked about something that was really important. Okay. Uh, and uh, it, it precedes this. Uh, and you were talking about uh, your experience at Morehouse College and how it, how it built, like, your value set. Um, yeah. And, and so on and so forth. So can you... Can you talk about what Morehouse did for you prior to your transition to going to the next step? When I got to Morehouse, it was the first time being in a city like Atlanta where, well, it was the first time I saw a homeless person or a person that was housing insecure actually outside. There was someone sleeping under the, uh, the highway overpass where I-20 meets I-75 and 85. It was a different city. When I moved on to campus, I was in this sea of, let's say, 18 to 20 year old, 22 year old black men from around the country who had all converged in one place. It was the only school of its kind. The first week or so that we were there, we were introduced to the school had some experiences that were orienting us to being in a context like this. Mm -hmm. We were both challenged because we had to wear ties every week mm -hmm. to crown form and freshman O, but we were also, we were, we were young black men in a context like this who were being loved mm -hmm. by a community of professionals who believed that young black men meant something, were worth something and had something to offer and needed to be protected so they could develop. So I was taught who I was in a place like that, even though there were there's still significant philosophical differences uh, that I have between Morehouse as an institution and my own view of the world. Mm -hmm. But that has nothing to do with what it meant to me to be embraced by a community like this. I would sit out in the hall. This is maybe any freshman dorm experience. But I was in the hallway with these dudes. We were freshmen. First semester, we didn't know, we probably didn't know much. But we were learning to think together. So we would sit out in the hallway and have these debates until one or two o'clock, like in the hallway. More, Morehouse's dorms at that time were cinder blocks. Like these were not beautiful residence halls that you see today. These were cinder blocks. They still are, to be honest. <laughs> we sit on this linoleum floor against the wall. Someone would open their door. Someone else would come out. And there would just be a conversation that happens between like 10 o'clock at night or maybe 9 and 1 or 2 a.m. and then people start falling asleep in the hallway, the brother will wake them up and tell them to go lay down. Like, but like there was, we weren't worried about like hurting each other. We weren't, I mean, there were forms of competition, like which dorm was the better one. I mean, but that kind of stuff. But we weren't in competition, existential con competition with each other. We were becoming brothers in that environment. And over the four years that I was at Morehouse, I think that's probably its greatest gift to me was an opportunity to become who I was going to become. Mm -hmm. I left there three weeks after I graduated from my undergraduate program. I started my master's program at Brown University in go. Providence, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. And when I got to Providence, it was the first time that I had ever sort of run up against the, the, the window. You left right? that nurturing. Hmm? You left that nurturing of the HBCU. I left the nurturing. I did. <clears throat> I left the nurturing, but I was 22. Like, yeah. I, had, I finished in four years. I didn't go to school in the summer, and... And I thought I was ready because I got all the credits. Like I, and I was an English major. Like I was ready. But I got to Brown and realized that my survival depended on more than my intellect. And I did not know that. So when I, when I showed up, I had done this correspondence, right? Because this was, this was 99. And I don't need, I, the internet probably existed. But let's say I had just gotten my first email in probably 97. I didn't <laughs> like it. So I had, an, I had some correspondence 
with a, a housing provider on this list that Brown provided to us. They sent all the admitted grad students a list in the mail. And it had names and addresses and phone numbers of places that were renting out apartments to Brown graduate students. And so I had corresponded with this person, made arrangements, set a date and time for my arrival. Again, this was sometimes phone call, but that was when long distance you pay by the, mu- the minute. It was mostly, <laughs> it was mostly like, like typing a letter or writing a letter and putting it in the mail and waiting three days before it got there. Like that was the norm at the yeah, time. Absolutely. So my best friend from college, this guy named Sam Logan, he and I were the closest homeboys at the time. He's also from Virginia, but he's from Norfolk. And he was living in Newport News at the time. So we were in the same environment. He drove me to Providence with his Chevy S10 pickup truck. <laughs> That's how I got moved. There was no airplane. There was no family trip. It was a, if I'm going to do this, I guess I got to get it figured out. And Sam was like, hey, homeboy, I got you. Mm-hmm. And so we made the nine or so hour trip to Providence, got to the house, knocked on the door after five o'clock because we went early and nobody answered. Knocked on the door after five o'clock. The lady answered the door. She was a white presenting woman, female. And you could tell the, the color in her face changed. Like, I remember this vividly because I was traumatized by it. And she said to me, no, the apartment is no longer available. I just rented it out this morning. Now, I've got all of my letters, my deposit, like all of this stuff. And she just closed the door and disappeared. And that was the end of that. And I had nowhere to go. But a, a cla- a, 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 another person who had graduated from Morehouse the year before I did, Duke Bradley, he played football. He went to Brown, and he came to s- – we, we connected when he had come back to visit, maybe for homecoming or something. I don't remember. Maybe commencement. But he was like, Antoine, when you get there, if anything happens, because it's going to be tough, here's the person that you need to be in touch with. And he just gave me her card or her nam- name on a piece of paper, and I kept it. I don't know why I kept it, but I'm glad that I did because that was the only person I could call when I was there. And she showed up, immediately met Sam and I at the Starbucks, went and got me an apartment, connected me with the Urban League and the NAACP and wanted to file a civil rights discrimination claim. She was willing to run it up the chain because she was trying to look out for a young black man who was trying to get stuff figured out. You know? No, and that's dope. And I think the what we asked was that you were talking about being isolated, being yeah. rebellious because of that incident that you uh, experienced in that moment is like, oh, this is what it's going to be like. Now I got to get my armor up and this is what it's going to be. So take us through what you went through afterwards. I, w- I want to comment on this because in, think- in thinking about it now, the, the layers of harm that I think that I was facing at 22 years of age were several in number. It wasn't just, no, you cannot have this apartment. And it wasn't, as I mentioned earlier, like just the people locking their doors mm-hmm. and rolling up their windows when I was walking down the street. And, 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 and these are not things I ever experienced. Hampton wasn't like that. Atlanta hella wasn't like that. Providence was very much like that. But it was also these rejections of me, what I represented and where I came from that would happen in the classroom. So... Uh, I, I think I got my undergraduate degree at a respectable university, or a college, right? It's not a university. Absolutely. A respectable college. Mm-hmm. But I'd get, I got to Brown, and I had professors say things to me like, Antoine, what do black people think about this? Mm. Wow. Uh, if you can't, this, is, this was true. This was also said, stated. If you have ever in your undergraduate experience taken a test that was short answer or had a multiple choice question, it was subpar. There was this condescension that positioned the Brown experience as a thing to be desired and anything that didn't follow that model as to be avoided. And I felt personally like I should not have pride, confidence in my Morehouse experience because what they're saying at Brown about other institutions, that's a lot like what I experienced at Morehouse. Maybe my Morehouse education was subpar. Some would say those are microaggressions or microinvalidations or what have you. Mm -hmm. I would say... It convinced me at that time that I wasn't enough. So I had the, I don't know where I'm going to live. I had the, I had my tuition covered because I received a scholarship, but I'm not even sure how I'm going to eat. I don't have a community. The only person I know is Sam. And back to that meeting Dr. Miller Burrell at the Starbucks, Sam left his truck 
with me in Providence and got a flight and flew back to Virginia to go back to his work and life and what have you, and then bought another flight to come back. And he knew I couldn't pay him for it. He knew I could not repay him. I had no family support financially. I had a lot of love, support, et cetera, but no like financial support to make ends meet. And he put his life on hold because he knew that I needed something and I didn't know how to ask him for it. And it was, but it was because we met at Morehouse and learned to care about each other and pay attention to each other that that's the cushion that helped soften my land when I got to Providence. But the things that I was experiencing, the I feel isolated, I feel angry, and I don't think I'm supposed to because anger makes white people nervous, especially if it's a black person, but I feel angry, and I feel angry in class because of that shit this professor just said. But I can't speak up because I know what retaliation is. Man, but so, right. so, 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 so I think my question is, does HBCUs equipped <clears throat> young black men and women to handle life outside of the South or places that are heavily populated with uh, black people? Because it seems like, yo, like when you was at Morehouse, you was in this sterile, utopic... Like yeah. nurturing environment yeah. and then when you left because because e exactly so it's funny how you went to teach how you you got to Colorado you taught at Montbello I graduated from Montbello and that's a lot how Montbello High School was when I was there you know your your principal's black your assistant principal's are black your student advisor is black all of the football coaches are black the the a good majority of the teachers are black right the people in the in the in the, the student body is black so <clears throat> there's a lot of nurturing there for young black men and women. Yeah. And then when I went out to Arizona State, it was like, hey man. <laughs> culture shock. <laughs> culture shock. But it's you more than get, culture shock. It's more, yeah, but then then it's like, I had to learn how to, ha I had never had white coaches, you know, um, like, you know, like, well, I'd, had I'd have to, George, like, yeah, 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 George. yeah, yeah, but that, but that, that was my one experience. Right. You know what I mean? Um, like, white football coaches and then now I'm dealing with like white people like on a different level right and I wasn't really equipped you know I wasn't I wasn't really equipped so for your experience living and like you know so my, my cousin went to Howard and she came out of Howard like hella militant like she came out of Howard I was like god damn you militant as fuck mm -hmm. right <laughs> but yo so I, I, I can I see that I see that as the HBCU experience like you get that knowledge itself and they're and they're building you up and they're pumping you up with all of this all of this confidence and hey, you can do it. We're gonna push you through it. We're gonna nurture you. But then now you go to Ivy League, where all that shit is out the window. No, that's a good point. And they're looking at Morris Brown, uh, Morris Brown College, like man, get that shit out of here. I didn't go to Morris. Brown. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. To Brown. Brown. Brown no, University. No, no, Morehouse. Morehouse. Sorry. Oh, Morehouse. Fuck. That's Morehouse. Right. I'm at Morehouse. We can edit. Where I'm getting all of this, uh, all of this nurturing, and now I'm at Brown. They're like, man, get that, get that Morehouse shit out of here, man. I don't think that I th I think Courtney your original question was at the start of your question you started to ask about whether or not HBCUs prepare students for things outside of the south or outside of predominantly black context. Yep. yep. And I'm not I'm not sure if I know that the answer to that but I but I want to I want to be honest about why. From from my experience there's no way I could be who I am today had mm -hmm. I not have gone through an experience like sure. studying yeah. at Morehouse College yeah, and sure. living on campus as a poor kid for four years. There, I couldn't be who I am today. And I also couldn't be who I am today if I did not have to bring to the table, to the mat, all these things I learned about myself and about my people and about our history at Morehouse in a context in which that wasn't welcome. But I don't think that means that Morehouse did not prepare me because I think the logical way to say that a school is supposed to prepare its students is to give them experiences and I would not want Morehouse to be a place where like they manufacture forms of whiteness other than the ones they already practice mm. like let us talk to you about how to prepare for a job interview in case your interviewer it, they might do that in business but they didn't do that in, in English right I think what Morehouse was supposed to do was give me a foundation but just like with any other human's development the security, the strength, the stability of that foundation is only tested when the weather changes, right? And when I went to a place like Brown and, and I experienced rejection, isolation, minimization, 
et cetera. I had some good friends. Like, don't get me wrong. It took some time. I made some good friends. Shout out to Joseph Edmonds and Simon and Keith and Marcus. Like, they created a community for me as well as some other people. They, they looked out for me. They invited me over for dinner. We talked shit to each other. I fried <laughs> chicken because I was doing this other thing. So I, had, I, I developed a network. And it was, it's always been a network of people who've seen me through. But Morehouse did what it was supposed to do, which is lay the foundation. I was angry when I moved to Denver because I had not been around that many white people since I left Brown. Mm. And that wasn't pleasant. And so I came to Denver expecting the same kind of thing. I had to bring down my militancy because I wanted to be more curious about what it means to be me in the world. And, and, and every once in a while in my conversations about Morehouse, <clears throat> people will hear me make comments about like these things that Morehouse taught us that I outright reject now in hindsight. Like, I don't believe that I am a professional because I wear a tie and a blazer. For sure. I'm a professional because I practice a profession. Mm -hmm. mm. And I decide to appear at work the way that I choose. I wore this to work today. Because so real this quick, is what I feel that, like. That, that's deep. So you feel like at Morehouse you were taught, like, hey, you have to present yourself a certain way in order to be a professional rather than focusing on the craft. And that's a form of what? White supremacy. Yeah. That, that, see, that's what's interesting <laughs> about that. That's why that shit is deep. Hey, yeah. What would you say, Antoine? I think Morehouse taught me respectability politics. They taught me to be polite, mm -hmm. ma'am and sir. I was raised in the South. That's sure. pretty common, right? I don't right. think it's unusual. We were expected to wear ties to crown form freshman year. Um, like, there, there were those gestures. But Morehouse was founded in 1867 to prepare black men to be teachers and ministers. Like, that's what it was created for. Mm -hmm. it, it wasn't a wider yeah. array. And in the late 19, this was 1867 is four years after the announcement of the Emancipation Proclamation and two years before it got to Texas. In any case, or two years after it got to Texas. In any case, when Morehouse was founded, it was founded to prepare black men to enter white society and to find careers in white society that would help them provide for their families. I don't have any shade to send about that. What I think is it took me becoming a professional to start to question the meaning of things like professionalism, mm -hmm. professional dress. Mm -hmm. And then I started to learn through practice about the various forms of white supremacist ideology. I try not to say white supremacy because it sounds like a statement of fact. And I think it's better to describe it as an ideology or as a way of thinking. It isn't fact. It's just a framework. Sure. And to me that framework typically doesn't hold up to scrutiny. So I had to scrutinize things like, well, what does it mean for me to put on a tie? I keep going back to the same example because that's the one that has resonated for most of my career. But I realized in my later adult years, I'm only 45, I don't mean in my 70s, but I mean like in my late 20s, early 30s, no, I should ask questions about these things. I don't have to dress like that. It doesn't make me any different. In fact, People will respect me when they see that I stick around and I do my job. Mm. Maybe the pressure to become something other than who I am will go away because I have demonstrated through my effort, through my commitment, through my follow-up, through my failures, that I'm willing to see something through. And that is what makes me a professional. And my experience has been, yeah, it's still the case. Now, I, you might want to ask another question. I was going to make one more anecdote and then we'll stop talking. No, no, no. This no, is, no, this is, go no, no, no. I, I go back talk. to Atlanta. I still, I still love this city. I go yeah. back to homecoming whenever I can. I didn't go this past year for work reasons. I'm a black man from Denver when I go back to Atlanta. And I come with my Denver sensibility. Like, I, I mean. You got I, your cowboy come, boots? What are you nah, saying? I don't, what are you, I don't, what are you I don't mean about? that. I don't, I don't mean that. I mean, I, I put mean, a guy vein. Like, I put a guy vein. I like to go skiing. <laughs> I, don't, I don't ski fuck winter sports. Hey, the, the seven hey, things. Hey, man, man, I like I'm the snowboard, man. I'm trying to be good, about, I'm trying like to be good about this. The, I'm trying to learn man, you how to appreciate the winter. You up there eating quinoa. I'm eating kale. I'm eating quinoa. I'm eating avocados Oat milk in my coffee. Yeah, I'm with you. Coconut milk. You got to get on that oat milk, man. When I go back to Atlanta, I remember that there is a, a social context there that is unlike my experience here. I think I've experienced Atlanta as having a disappearing middle class. There is growing lower income communities, housing prices are skyrocketing, 
entertainment has taken off in unprecedented ways because of all of the creative arts that are happening out there. So now when I go to Atlanta, I'm looking at million dollar houses and Ferraris on the street. Mm. Like Buckhead used to be bars, like 15th and Market down here. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You walk through Buckhead and it was there are bars everywhere, people getting roasted and throwing up on the streets and going back in for another one. And now Buckhead looks like Rodeo Drive. It's high end stores where people are spending inordinate amounts of money and it's no longer the kind of gathering place for 20 year olds that it was when I was there. So Morehouse, I mean, Atlanta feels like a different city. Mm -hmm. So when I go to Atlanta, I may fit in one economic class because of my profession, my career, my life, my family style. But when I, when I go to Atlanta, that's not the kind of experience. I don't want to have Atlanta's upper bougie experience personally, because it doesn't feel welcoming to me. Mm -hmm. If people ask me who I am and what I do, I feel like I'm in DC. Someone's asking me, like what part which, of the government you work for? Who I work for? Who's mm-hmm. my? Who do I know? Like Atlanta yeah. started to feel like that, and mm-hmm. I don't. I don't like it. But right. I still love the city. Like shout out to Atlanta. It's one of the dopest cities we got. But I've learned about myself in Denver to be something that outward appearance. Aside Doesn't from matter. aside from sneakers, like I don't spend my money on things that you could easily see are worth it because I just I just want to be me. Yeah. That's right. it. I don't want to be some other version of myself. So real and quick, Denver does allow room for that. Yeah. Oh, no, absolutely. absolutely. Uh, so I think this plays, uh, we're having a great, great conversation, and I think this plays into um, DJEC. I want to make sure I'm saying that right. Yeah, that's right. Denver Journal, Education and Community. I got you, Spence. Um, <laughs> so DC. What's that? Yeah, I call him DC. DC? DC. Dr. 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 Childress. <laughs> there we go. I like that it. That does he sound got, cold-blooded. He, he I like that. Uh, with that, I was reading the latest article that you, not that you published, but that was DJEC published. published. Yeah. And I think it speaks a lot to the things you're talking about, right? So everybody up here has a four-year education. You have a PhD. Yeah. And within that article, it talked what success looks like for high school students and the pressure that is put on mm-hmm. for children at a young age to say, hey, this, the end goal is to go to college or higher learning. Tell us a little bit about how you want to – let me back up. With DJEC, what I like that's awesome is that you all are using digital content that is supported by the community. And what I mean by that is that you're having these town hall-like conversations that turn into digital content that is supported – and driven and facilitated by these communities. So I want to make sure I put that out there. Thanks. I think that is very dope. In that, now transitioning to one of the conversations that you all had, tell us a little bit about this perception that you're trying to change when it comes to what success looks like in education. I wish I had like Jeopardy music. <laughs> he's about to get deep, y'all. Like, yeah, he's yeah, coming. He's, it's coming. Like, <laughs> silence is <and> gone. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Why was it called before the storm? <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> Definitely. I hope you got a good editor. <laughs> <laughs> um, we started this work under the premise of a fundamental belief. And that belief is the word public in public education actually means something. Partly it means that the funds are provided by the public through taxation. Mm -hmm. It also means that schools have a responsibility to the public for the public's investment in schools. And education is supposed to be free to the general public. My perception of that has been The public is us. It isn't just voters. It isn't just legislators. It isn't just wealthy folks atop the hill. It is moms like mine who were single, unemployed, with multiple children who wanted something better for their own children. And I think that our better commitment in public education is to those individuals who are trusting that schools will do what they need to do for their children 
to have an opportunity to have a successful life. And I don't mean that just in terms of like income level. So recently we partnered with another organization in town called Ednium. E-D-N-I-U-M, I think is the spelling. Ednium, the Alumni Collective. And Ednium is an organization that was founded by alumni from DPS who were interested in organizing themselves to do advocacy around things like education and policy and leadership. So this is a group of alumni ages 17 to 30 who were, who've become critical, productively critical, of their education. So they came to me and asked, their ED, their director came to me and asked, hey, we want to do some research, and can DJEC help us? And I'm answering the question this way because I want to highlight that what we do is these community conversations, that's our model. But we turn them into various products res in response to the kinds of questions that we think are coming up. And I'll give you two examples to make the distinction, and then I'll, I'll try and stop talking. So when the executive director of Ednium reached out to me last year, it was to organize a research study that would use our model of community discourse and then source out of that some information that we could report to Denver Public Schools mm -hmm. and supplement that with the survey. So we had quantitative data from students from four DPS schools, qualitative data, or mm -hmm. former students, these were all alum, qualitative data from students from four alumni from four Denver Public Schools at the high school level all curious about what their perceptions of success were imposed upon them, repeated to them when they were in school, and what it meant for them once they were no longer in school and had some experience in life. What we were trying to figure out in this partnership as the research group that was going to be published in the report was whether there was alignment, whether success as students remember it from their school experience was consistent with their values as people with cultural backgrounds, were they aligned to their goals and aspirations? Did students, do they recall experiencing any support for them to set their own pathways forward? Or were they given a mark to meet, mm -hmm. that mark was externally exposed and imposed, and they were measured by it? And we learned all kinds of stuff. Like, you can read about it, right? Yeah. right. We learned all kinds of stuff. Every single school, the alum reported overwhelmingly that education was the the definition of success that was fed to them over and over and over The next again. level of education. Top level. Yes. Finish yeah. high school and go <clears throat> yes. on to school. Yeah. University, college, higher learning, to your question, Jay. That was top. When they had experience in life outside of school, most of them all actually went to a college or university. Formal education became the least important indicator of success. What was more important to them in their experiences were family, joy, happiness in life, and a meaningful career. It mm. wasn't go to school to have gone to school. But we, we studied that because this group was really interested in it. What does success mean? And can public education modify its thinking about the outcome of education equaling a form of success as not more education? The proportionate, the proportionate nature, kids of color, including black, indigenous, Latinx, yeah, those groups, who finish high school in this city and go off to college and have to take a remedial class when they go to college is concerning to me. I think it was the case. I could be wrong about this. So let's say this is a regional estimate. 2012, 75% or so of kids of color from DPS when they went off to college, for those who did go to college, 75% of them approximately had to take a remedial class. That was leaving high school, going to college, paying college tuition for high school education that did not count towards your graduation because it was remedial. So it didn't count for course credit towards graduation. And that just seems like a bum deal. Mm -hmm. And we're not sending the bill back to the district and say, you cover the tuition because this shows yeah. that you didn't do what you were supposed to do. That's not how our system is set up. I'm saying this because I want to highlight our perspective with the Denver Journal of Education and Community and some of the other work that we're trying to do is to honor what community members are saying. We can learn what they're saying when all we do is try and create an environment for people to talk to each other, and we want to be good listeners, so we record it. We don't share people's names. We don't tell, we don't try to let, like, put people on the spot. The goal is to get people to talk to each other. When we first started, 2018, we could talk about the genesis if it's necessary, but I won't get into it now. 
we started with this model where we would just tell people, like, if, if you can invite six or seven of your re- neighbors to your house, we'll pay for the food. We'll pay for the recording. If you need interpretation services, we'll pay for that. If you need food, we'll provide that. If somebody in the neighborhood is going to prepare the food, we'll pay them for it. That's why we want to grant money is so we can cycle it back to the community so that people can form community together and neighbors could talk who hadn't had a chance to talk before. Coworkers could have conversations about things that were education related but not about the PD they just went to. We just wanted to build community with people, use the resources to provide that, let them have genuine conversation where we might ask one hopefully good question Conversation can go anywhere it wants. Right. Right. But in my mind, that is a representation of what it means to do education thinking that is informed by the public because it's supposed to be public education, not just economic public, not just the voting public, but the public of citizens, residents who are trusting that their children will be better because they went to school. Like that is where public education's primary commitment is supposed to be. This, this podcast. That's dope. And I think. So let's. I want to go back to the education part, but let's since we're here with DJEC about how you involve the community. That's a, sometimes that's a tough thing to do. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Co and I both live in Park Hill. We try to be active in the community. Try to get information from here, there. It's you know it's coming from all directions, different streams of like, uh, keep your ear over here or keep your ear over there. How do you solve that problem? Because it, it seems like for you, you start off with small. Are you like, how do you solicit like, hey, we want to have these small town halls or gatherings where we have just authentic conversations so that we can feel the pulse of the community? How do you formulate that? When we first started, I mean, these were just favors based on relationships, to be mm-hmm. honest. That's okay. how I feel like most of my life works anyway. So I know people in education. I was an educator for a long time. I'm a higher ed educator now. I work in an ed program. Um, Education is my area for the most part. So I know people who are in the education world. And I would just ask them to hold the conversation. That's all. Like at their house. They weren't like formal events. In fact, we tried to do one of our first conversations at the Green Valley Rec Center. And like 32 people signed up, which was a lot. Six people actually came, seven maybe. <laughs> 32 people signed up. I remember this because I was impressed. I was like, this is going to be great. Yeah. And it didn't happen. And that's just how it is. Because what we're asking people to do is in addition to what they already have to do to be involved in their community, to be involved in the work of their children. You got to put and action behind it, right? You got to put action behind it. But you got to, I think, I think my expectations are people will come when they can. And when they cannot come, they just weren't there. But I don't want it. It shouldn't feel like work. Like part of the reason we went through this community conversations approach is because I didn't want to feel like a research focus group. I didn't want to feel like a town hall, like I'm running for office. Let me hear your thoughts and then parrot them so I can get elected and then forget what you said. Mm -hmm. We actually wanted to be responsible to honor people's voices, but we wanted to be in a context in which they felt like they were just talking, not being scrutinized, not being observed and watched. So, in fact, what I would do at the very beginning is – go to whoever was hosting the conversation, make sure they had what they need, introduce myself to the group that was going to be talking, tell them thank you, and then I would leave. Because if this was not my community already, I didn't want to be the, I didn't want them to get the impression that I was there checking what they were saying. I want them to be free to talk. So, so how, how do you solve, like a lot of the times, <clears throat> people who take surveys are passionate one way or the other, generally speaking. For sure. Um, and thinking about what you're doing in these town hall conversations is bringing like these small intimate gatherings to get people to talk. A lot of the times people who are doing um, surveys, well, let's just call it a survey, um, are passionate one way or the other. So how do you get rid of the like the edge cases, like the squeaky wheel um, is going to make the most noise and listen to like what the core is really saying? I will say I try to be a good listener. Sure. (laughs) I mean, that's the best answer I can. Well, like, you could be a good listener, but it's No, I know. I have a better answer. Okay, go ahead. I'm just buying time. (laughs) (laughs) My bad. Nah, it's cool. Um, So we we set up these mechanisms to help, help with this. Okay. 
One of them is this disclosure about how we will use people's information. Mm -hmm. The second is um, we only ask a very open-ended question. So we don't show up to these conversations with an agenda. Like, I'm not trying to make enemies with any district or superintendent or legislator or principal or teacher or anybody. Like, I'm, I don't have any interest in that. That's not why I got into this. It was to let people talk, hear what they say, and be honest about what they're saying. And in conversations at the beginning where we were asking people to invite their neighbors and friends and relatives to have a conversation over a meal, it was so they can en engage in a community together. And if there was a squeaky wheel, to use your metaphor, mm -hmm. that's up to that group of people to deal with, not mm. me, right? Because I'm, mm -hmm. I'm not there. It's not facilitated. It's not guided. Yeah. It's just a, for exa example, if, if you go to a, a community and say, if you could have anything you want out of your child's education, what would it be? Mm -hmm. Talk about that. And people talk. There is no, do you think that children should be measured based on their academic performance or their behavior, or do you think they should create their own pathway and then we measure that? Like You're it's not, not like leading to the we're witness. Not t no, there's mm -hmm. no, there's no need for it. I think start big picture and try and derive meaning. That's what we were trying to do. Mm -hmm. I think often when things get reduced to sound bites and you lose nuance and you lose context and you lose, lose the relationships, what you get doesn't mean anything. It's just a symbol, mm -hmm. but it doesn't mean anything. And what we're trying to do is find what means something to people and be honest about it. Got it. Man, so what's the so what's the vibe now in terms of um, college, man, and, high, and higher education? Like, cause you know, I think about it, I'm like, like yo, like if I could, if my son could figure out a way to solid to make a solid living, man, without going to college and not have to deal with student loans and not have to go through that shit, like, like yo, I'm totally down with that, you know? Yeah, you should be. I work at a university. I've been at CU Denver since 2010. I've been here for, I don't know how many years, a, a while. I make my living in a higher ed context. Education is my area. My son is 17. He's going to be 18 in May. He's graduating from Northfield High School on May 20, whatever day that happens. Uh, and he wants to go to Morehouse. This, this podcast, Bussin' Bussin'. And I want to support that. I did not ask him to go to Morehouse. I didn't recommend that he went to Morehouse. I did not. You can ask him. He'll tell you because he's honest. <laughs> but he decided he wanted to go to Morehouse, and I think it's because of what he learned. About, I can tell you why. But he, he wants to go to Morehouse, and I'm going to support it. If he had decided, Dad, I want to take a year and work at the Taco Bell and then figure out if I want to go to school or if I want to pick up a trade, I'd support that. You just need to be going about your life, mm. and I'll support it. Mm -hmm. That message I feel consistent about because I also understand when people realize that college is often not worth the value for some experiences, particularly for people who don't complete their degree. Yeah. It isn't worth the value. There's a demographic cliff, people are speculating, because we've overbuilt colleges, our population is not as robust as the baby boomer, boomer generation, and we're a few years out from schools having to close their doors because they can't keep enough students to to, to make the school function, right? So what adjustments are colleges making? I don't know. I'm trying to figure it out. Let me tell you how, though. I'm on a commission called the Western Interstate Commission of higher, for Higher Education. Mm -hmm. They run a program that most people are familiar with. It's called the WUI, the Western Undergrad Exchange. So if you live in I got Denver, a scholarship from did them. Did you? Yep. So I, I work with that commission. I'm a commissioner. I'm one of three commissioners for the state of Colorado, and I just got voted vice president, vice chair of the commission in November. This group... Its work is to think about these things and try and help states mm -hmm. solve for it, right? So schools are thinking about things like micro-credentialing, right? It's a, the concept means you take a few courses, you get some certificates, that can stack up, and you can take that to an employer mm -hmm. without a bachelor's of science, a bachelor of arts, or maybe even associate's degree, but it'll show that you've got specified training in an area. Colleges are trying to figure out how to do that. Google has been doing it, and other corporations have been doing it, as a way to argue higher ed is inconsequential, unnecessary. You can make more money working with us. Food every day will pick you up. Game room, whatever, date nights, all these things that corporations do nights, to definitely. make the workplace mm -hmm. fun as an argument against higher ed's relevance. And so, Jan, so I'll, we, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll go ahead. I was say, we live in that space. And, like, I see it on the recruitment end. Uh, like, there's a ton of people – 
of getting non traditional with non traditional backgrounds, going to boot camps, yeah. going, you know, incubators, incubators, people that watch YouTube for yeah. eight hours a day and learn how to code. And there's some of the best coders it's out there. It's a thing. And it, but the corporations need to be bought in and they need to have sustainable programs and leaders that support that transition because working in corporate America is a lot different than watching YouTube for eight hours a day. So, no, I agree with that. And, and I'll push back a little bit because I think there is a weird dynamic there of like you do get the trade at boot camps, but usually this is how it works, I, at least at the company I work for. You get a four year degree, you, I don't know, you might be a, a music teacher or something like that. Then you go to boot camp to go get coding, you know, touring school or whatever. Then they'll give you that shot. I've never seen the other way where it's like, I don't have the degree, but I have two years of boot camp and now we'll consider you for a position. I, I'm not thinking about boot camp in particular because I think it's a specific example that I don't fully understand. Yep. What I'm thinking about is the fact that institutions like colleges and universities across the country are trying to figure out how do you measure forms of learning that weren't delivered through 15 weeks in a classroom at a college? How do you measure other ways? A different path different pathways, and can that become like the purview that. of higher ed? But how can they monetize, and then also how can they monetize that? At this the end is, of the day. Colorado. <laughs> yeah. so but I mean, institutions have bills questions. to pay too, right? Like, yeah. I mean, yeah. they're yeah. just no, like no, a business. No, I get that. No, I yeah. get that. It's just, it's just, it's just, that's the, 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 that's the answer to the question. Like, that's the adjustment that higher ed is making to try to fill this gap in terms of kids watching YouTube, going out and getting their own experiences, Going to these boot camps and then coming to these jobs, saying like, "Yes, I can do this." Because Eric, man, I saw I saw an interview with Eric Snowden. He had not near no degree, and rose quickly up in the military. And I was like, "Well, how did yeah, that, it's like, not how unusual. that happen?" Yeah, but that's military. I no, think. no, that's but I'm just, different. I'm just, I'm but just. But to your point, yeah, you could be successful. So let's let's spice it up a little bit because I do yeah. think there's individuals out there who definitely just have a knack, or they just fall into a pocket where they're very honed in. Uh, engaged in what they might do in life, and, and they find that, right? And they just, Eric Snowden's an example, right? There's not a lot of people that are like that. So us being that we all went to higher learning education, like I want to hear y'all's take of like, would you go back and say, I'm not going to college or I'm not going to a university and take the same path I did and change it up a little bit? Because for me, I wouldn't. I would do the exact same thing that I did. I'm an engineer, and I think engineer jobs have that's always a, been a high demand. Space. And that's, that's what I mean. So it's like intentional. Like when I went, mm -hmm. I knew exactly. when I came yeah. out what you that I would have a higher quality of life or I could get a job and I can have different paths. Yeah. Yeah. Some people and, don't do that. Uh, so I think people that are in... Uh, specialized fields, right? Uh, I, case in point, engineering, um, the people that are going into like PhD programs or like, you know, I, I want to be a doctor. I want to be a dentist. I want, you know, whatever. Um, there's, there is a path for those people. A and medical doctor. Medical doctor. Yeah, yes. Okay. And there's, and I'm not eliminating, I'm not saying all of them, but those are just like examples, right? You have individuals like myself, like I knew um, I was going to be in sales, I knew it. Like, I, I knew I was going to be in sales, went to the school of business, and I was like, uh, I don't like math that much. <laughs> I'm kidding about this joint. So I went and did communications. Do you need a communications degree in order to do sales? Do you need a master's degree like I have in order to be what I do in my current role that's not sales? No. Do I need it? No. No. You know what you need? A network. Yep. And people skills. And pe yeah, you you need to know how to move in in this room, and you need to know the people to talk to, and the people that are going to tap you on the shoulder when there's an opportunity or give you a chance. And that's that. And that's that. You can't coach speed. There's what? You can't coach speed. You either have it or you don't. Uh huh. Like like th th that's no, what I'm saying. And then, and then that's why kind of kind of when you look at higher education. It feels like it's kind of been, oh, it's slow motion. Brother. It's it's kind of been positioned in this way to where it's this gatekeeper to get this, uh -huh. but then it puts you into more debt. 
to where in actuality in sales, like yes, like in pharmaceutical sales, like I got a, I got two friends that that, that are in pharmaceutical sales, right? Mm -hmm. And they say, yeah, I know the product, like yeah, but I don't know it like the back of my hand. But I have a a genuine a genuine like a general idea of what the program does. But the largest part of my job is my people skills, my ability to connect, mm -hmm. my ability to work any room I, I I get into. It's not like it's not like, yeah, I'm a, I'm a genius engineer, but then I'm a little socially awkward around everybody else. Like, yo, like, but let Michelle, me. Michelle Pullman. Michelle Pullman to tell you, like, yo, my job is to close deals. I go out, I go out, I mm -hmm. meet with these people. It has zero to do with kind people of. People buy from people. People buy from people. And it's, how, 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 what is my ability to work with someone on, a gr on, like on a ground level or, or whatever level they're on to make them, um, Connect with me enough. So to real quick, sell this. so for that example, does she have a four year education? Yeah, she has a four edu year three years education. So I, so I, I, like but that's the gatekeeper. That's the gate. That's the gate. Example. Though. I, but see, th so I think gate. what education does do. I, I answered in you, these, Jay. but in these situations, you have a network. You I didn't have a network. I built that. Okay. Yeah. Like so, what I'm saying is the network. In most cases, this is what I, my thoughts are and my theory is that you get those networks through experiences as you go on in life, right? Well, And I think some of the people you rub elbows with at these corporations are also at these four-year uh, institutions where you're not just going to meet somebody at Taco Bell. Like, I'm not... <laughs> I'm not, yeah, I'm not yeah, no, discrediting you're that, uh -huh, but you're yeah. not going to meet somebody that works at Oracle at Taco Bell and be like, yo, you know, we're building this network and then soon we're going to be working at Fortune 500 companies. Well, no, 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 no. It's, 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 again, it's the gate to get to the network, right? It has nothing to do with the skills that you have inherently. If you're a people person, you're a people person. If you're a connector, but that, means you, that you, you have you, the skills inherently. You have the skills inherently. That's what I'm saying. You can't coach speed. You can't coach it. Like you, a motherfucker's fast. I can't. Like maybe I could tweak things here and there, but he's fast. Like Damien's really good. With, the Damien's really good with people. Damien can get to a room and actually have conversation with people. I can train a person all day. I could train a person all day, but I could put them out there with people where it's now it's nuanced, where some of these conversations may go outside of what you've been trained to do. You may have to work with people from different economic uh, or social status, people who have, who have different lived experience. So do you feel that's the same for math skills? Like you no, 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 but that's or that, you don't? But that's what he said. No, but that's what he said. He said, if you're going to college for something that's driven and totally locked in, like you said, I want to be an engineer. But somebody can learn that. That's what the school is for. But that's Dog. new. In all fairness, that is new. Dog. Engineering is not no, new. It's not no, new. Software like engineering more. is new. But yeah. well, that ain't even new. But, no, you but, but engineering learn. has been around for but you can't, decades. Different level access. But you, can't, but you can't learn. It's hard to learn how to work with people. I like, think like, you can learn that. Like we, we, I don't, we learn I don't, I don't, our job so, all the like time. You, you, play, you play on a football team. I'd be so. interested to hear you, Antoine, yeah. on this. Okay. Yeah, how are you feeling? He's like, like, he's like, these motherfuckers crazy. I'm, no, yeah, he's like, he's like, let me listen in and I'm yeah. gonna you just cook you something up real quick. <laughs> <laughs> no pressure. I'm, I'm thinking about a different question than the one that you all are answering, I think. Okay. Um, I, to, be, to be honest, I work in higher ed, I spend a lot of higher ed, atomic higher ed context. And so I've learned through being there about what higher ed is and how it works. I'm still learning. Mm -hmm. I was trained to think about education in public, sort of pre-K. I wasn't taught, trained in pre-K, but let's say pre-K through 12th grade. Yep. I approach thinking about education with a sort of different central tension. And that tension is, uh, this will sound very familiar to you, I, I ask this question every two to three weeks in almost every class I teach. Like, what is the purpose of education? How do we know that education is doing what it's supposed to do if we're not clear about its purpose? I don't operate from the perspective, personally, that the purpose of education is to help people get ready to have jobs. I don't think that's the purpose of education. I don't, I don't think that education was, is, I don't support the perspective 
that the prime directive of education is the workforce. I support the directive that the purpose of education is societal benefit by mm. human actors who have learned to understand themselves and the context that they're in. And they can do that through any kind of profession. Like, I don't care. That's why if my son is like, I don't want to go to school, I just want to have a job and hang out with my friends, play video games for a year, fine. That's dope. Because you yes, don't we, need yes, to be in school cast, for four bustin years. Bustin and where bustin he wants to go to college now is going to be $50,000 a year. I could say, carry that ass to CCD <laughs> uh -huh. and save me $45,000 yeah, a year. Yeah, yeah, right? Absolutely. But I, I want to support him in having opportunities that I didn't have, and I have the resources and the wherewithal to make that happen for him. So I'm willing to do it for him and for my daughter because it will be for their benefit so that they can come to know themselves. He wants to be a civil rights attorney. He came up with that all on his own. Up until April, he wanted to be an engineer. And then he decided he wanted to be an attorney because he met this guy named Seth who was some Jordan Fours, prosecutor for Fulton County. And my son was like, oh, I can do that too. And decided <laughs> that he wanted to be it. something else, right? Because he And saw it'll probably it. change again. It'll probably change again. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But I think that education's purpose is, it, I mean, this is broad philosophical shit, right? Like, it is about how do we, how can an institution like that Help us come to know ourselves. I want my son to be in an environment where he's going to be told your blackness, your sense of style, your hair, your curiosity, your humor. Like, that's beautiful stuff that we're not going to chip away at to make you into some version <laughs> of podcast. whiteness bustin', that you bustin'. can carry in your black body. He doesn't want that. That is so dope, man, because I think... To be honest, as uh, until this tech industry, until you had like the the Zuckerbergs and the Googles and into it, like coming to work in a hoodie, not wearing a tie, like I think that's what when we were growing up discouraged a lot of us from like, yeah. nah, I don't want to get into that because they're that gonna cornball. change my yeah. whole identity. <laughs> I'm gonna be, the, I'm not gonna be, you know what I'm saying? They're gonna, I can't be black no more. I can't be this or that. So now nah, fuck that. I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna do what I want to do. And figure it out from there because that's not the path for me. I'm not changing who I am. There's a, a, a he passed away some years ago. He did his research at uh, UCAL Berkeley. His name was John Ogbu, uh, Nigerian, I believe. And he, in the mid to late 1980s, was studying the school level experiences of black American students in the Bay. This was, the, this was the person who developed in academia the term acting white because what he learned was that these black kids in particular, kids of color in schools in the Bay, associated educational performance with being white. Yeah. And they believed that in order to be themselves, they needed to keep it real like in a Dave Chappelle skit when keeping yeah. it real goes wrong. <laughs> like <Right>. They believed <laughs> that in order for them to be truly black, they did not need to have in any educational aspirations or ambitions. Yeah. They did not believe that there was opportunity for them on the other side of their educational experiences. And they thought that what they needed to do, he called it oppositional culture. They developed a way of being in school that was always in op opposition to what they understood or perceived to be these enactments of whiteness. And that was in school. You were talking about careers. like. I don't want to go to work and look like that. But these were kids who were saying, I don't, I don't want, want to go school to school yeah, 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 and absolutely. be anything because I can't be who I am because there's no real chance. And it wasn't that people were saying, be white like us. It was that they were being tracked, sitting in the back of the class, overrepresented in special education. They were having all of these contextual experiences that were sending messages to them about their value. And then they formed an oppositional community around that, and that was 40 years ago when this research was taking place. It just gets scaled up when young people become adults and are still cycling through some of the experiences that they had in their youth. They just, you know, it's like when you go through, you, I used to play Super Mario Brothers when I, was in, when I was in middle school, right? And you beat these bosses, level one, and you go to level two, and you gotta beat another boss, you go to level three, and it's a bigger boss, it's more ferocious, but it's the same boss. And, and like going to school and learning these messages that you have to learn how to negotiate, and then, and then someone saying, like, you got to go to college. If you want to have a career, you got to go to college. And then yeah. for, for careers to prioritize college, which is a very recent phenomenon, that you actually need a college degree. Mm -hmm. When my parents were younger. They, my dad don't have a degree. High school diploma was it. it. Work. 
Absolutely. I know that times have changed. Our economy has grown. Our society is different. But one of the primary levers that was pulled was that corporations participated in requiring higher education, which is not about job skills in most areas. It is about the experience of college, the time in college, and 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 I think there's a value proposition dis- distinction there that I'm trying to make. Bars. Man, man, yo, Bars. so why yes, can't so, so that's what I'm saying? So like, bussin, why can't bussin. I be taking an apprenticeship under someone, and then, then a company respect the apprenticeship that I work directly under James? Like, if I work directly under James for for three to four years, man, under in terms of code and being a computer engineer, like I worked with this man. You know what I mean? H- highly respected computer engineer. You know what I mean? He has the experience. He has the credentials. I worked under him. Why can't he just sign for me? Well, and then they, bam, they do you have hire apprenticeship me. programs. They do. Yeah. But um, but but what comes along? But what has to be in in concert with the apprenticeship program? Um, I'll be a four year degree. And, th- and that's kind of what I'm saying. Like like in ancient times, it wasn't like, hey, go go to this college. Hey, no, I worked under this times. master. That's no, I'm just, hey, yo, no, so, no, so I'm trying no, to no, break right shit here. down to the, no, the, the 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 beginning level. Like like yo, I, I worked under this master uh, craftsman or freaking uh, blacksmith. Blacksmith, mm-hmm. right? And I became a master blacksmither. <laughs> if, if that's what they're called, <laughs> blacksmithers. Smith. I like it, man. Spit your facts, you yo. know, man. Then now I got to sit here and have a. Mm-hmm. I, I sit. I, I do this apprenticeship under a master blacksmith, and then I got to do an extra four years of blacksmithing <laughs> to 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 verify the fact that I, you know, like it's valid. Well, yeah, no, that is valid, Co. And I just think to Antoine's point, when I talk about corporate, that's just a different element that you put on the top of a layer of a cake, right? Like it's education, you know, a higher education. The goal is for most people that we perceive is that, you know, the American dream is like, yeah, working in a corporate America setting for most people. And once you put that layer on it, there's just a lot of things that come with that. And it's like, you know, nepotism, yeah. other things. And it has to be a standard of like, oh, well, you know, you know, Jay and you have that network and you were able to go up under him. But this person over here wasn't able to do that. So, you know, it's just a lot of laws and stuff that come into play, but can I feel like, go uh, ahead. No, 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 not, if you weren't done. No, 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 go ahead, uh, um, add to that. I, I want to go back to DJ real quick um, and tell you one thing that I love about it is I like read through. Um, a, lot of, a lot of companies in general, they'll push out products based on what they think society needs, right? And they push them out and the products get rejected. They don't get used. They don't have research on why people aren't using them. You all start with the customer, and you listen to them, and then you build products based on that. Um, to me, I think that's where the world is going. I'd, I'd, like, to th- I'd like to think that's true. Mm-hmm. I will also say I am not a practicing capitalist, so I don't have a model that's like, how do we monetize this so I can retire off of this journal? It is had nothing to do with monetization, by the way. Oh, yeah, you're right. What I was saying. Yeah, yeah. No, okay. It does. I, I understand that. I understand that. I, I just think that most organizations exist in our society to generate revenue. That's yeah. why they exist. Yeah. To produce a product, provide a service, and to do that for a fee that will increase profits. Mm-hmm. And all of shareholder capitalism is about doing that in the interest of the shareholders, not in the interest of the workers. Mm-hmm. Right? That's what shareholder capitalism is about. In fact, the book I was mentioning earlier, uh, Woke Inc., is helping me think differently about capitalism. I don't, I'm, not a, I'm not a pro-capitalist person, but I understand where I live. That book is arguing that, and I'll come back to DJ, don't forget, I won't forget. No, it's all good. That book is arguing in part that because sh- stakeholder consumerism has joined capitalism, now there's this thing called stakeholder capitalism where corporations are attempting to position themselves as being responsive to the community of disruptors, like wokeness. So they're making Black Lives Matter statements, while at the same time making back, they're making Black Lives Matter statements and we stand for women's rights, while female employees in one particular organization were being sexually assaulted at work by other employees 
And the court found the company not responsible. So the company did not have to pay, take care of these employees. Because but of those they, statements? But they were also making statements like, we protect, we love women's rights. So what this book seems to be arguing is what capitalism is becoming mm -hmm. is not just stakeholder capitalism, but share, I'm sorry, not just shareholder capitalism, but stakeholder capitalism as a way to generate more revenue, hide behind a moral curtain, and still do really egregious stuff that's self-interested in the background. Right? Oh, absolutely. So my orientation to the work that we do in our education and community space isn't about how do we turn a profit, how do we tell people what they need to think. Like, we're not marketers. We're not telling you that you need to look this way, wear this stuff, smell this way, and buy these things, and then you have value. Our starting proposition is your voice matters. You have value. You have thoughts. Give us that and help us do something good with it. Now, I will say we started this work in 2018. This podcast. It's 2023, six days now. And uh, it took me until the fall of 2021, let's say around September, October, to get clear about who our audience was for this journal. Because all we were doing was producing content. Like, if you build it, they will come. We'll write it because it's what their voices say. We'll tell you what we think it means, and people will read it. Not very clear. Very abstract. Who is it for, Antoine? Anybody? That's what funders would say. Like, who's your audience? Everybody. Mm -hmm. Our whole community. Because I don't know no, who absolutely. it's for. <laughs> I just know who's telling us the things. That's the community. So then we, we, I became clear about the relationship of the community perspective to the product itself. I don't perceive that most of the people who come to a community conversation have some food, meet some people, talk about some stuff, will want to pick up that journal and read it from cover to cover. I don't. They are welcome to. That's why we make it available online at no cost. But I think our actual audience needs to be people who are making institutional decisions in education that affect the individuals who told us the stuff that shows up in the text. So our source is the community, but our audience, funders, legislators, educators, board members. Those are the people that we want to influence because many of them lack, even though they're democratically elected representatives in a lot of cases, lack relationship with communities of color, low-income communities, refugee and immigrant communities. That, like the distance is broad, the wall is high, and it's thick. Oh. Right? So what we're trying to do is say, let's put a window in that wall. We're not trying to tear the wall down. Mm -hmm. We just want to take one of those cinder blocks, replace it with glass, so you can actually see people on the, uh, are on the other side and they're having experiences. Oh, so man. can you make decisions <laughs> in this, this district podcast, or in the state bustin', bustin'. that represent what these people are saying and what they need and what they experience and what they expect? That's all we're trying to do. But it took me three years to figure out that that's the, the relationship of, like, like oh, you talk, keep talking that. Hey, talk. and talk and that you know, man. one thing that <laughs> uh, they that tease talk. me because I always say this, you cannot have empathy without proximity. No, you cannot. Yep. You cannot. You can have charity, and that window you can builds have pity. Yeah, you cannot have yeah. proximity. And that window yeah. builds. No, I agree. Proximity. So that's yeah. so 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 okay okay okay. So so with that being said, and you being, and you currently being with uh, with CU Denver, and you know kind of your background and and to, to, to Damo's point, you can't have empathy without proximity. Hmm. But Dion's at Boulder now. Yes. And. It, 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 He's about to bring some culture to he's going he's about to bring some culture to Boulder that Boulder ain't had <laughs> <laughs> ever like I like ever like not not from I'm not I'm not saying from the players perspective you just I'm saying about from in general. the community the community perspective the head coach perspective at Boulder is about to be mm -hmm. Dion and and what he's what's coming with him that's that's black entertainment that's black athletes. That's going to be more. That's going to be an uh, increase in black student body, and it's, he's bringing a different type of athlete. It's not going to be the furthest south that CU goes for football. Now it's, isn't going to be Texas. This is this is like they got kids Florida, Georgia, California, California Tech. Like yo, he's broadening it out. So, what do you think? That's how it's going to play up in CU, man. How is CU going to be able to kind of? contain him and handle him. I don't know anything about CU Boulder. I try not to go. I like I like Denver because I understand the city. Yes. Mm -hmm. that's, that's my first answer. My second answer, though, is 
I, th- I think just like any other relationship, it's going to come with its bumps. And one thing I will say that I hope that all listeners to this podcast have in mind is that we should not participate in scapegoating. Let me tell you, the first time CU loses, the kinds of things mm. that people will probably say, mm-hmm. not the right pick, he wasn't a good fit, go back to Jackson State, all of the things that come with mm. the backlash of what we might call black progress will probably happen. And often black people participate in it. Like when he got the job and they were like, you uncle Tom, you a sellout. Instead of saying that brother has leveled up, let's all celebrate him and support him. People will come in after him because he was more of a symbol to the human. And I think that maybe we can think about this as he'll get to Boulder. He'll get integrated. He'll be really, really segregated. He'll be watched really, really closely. If he makes a misstep, it's going to be blown out of proportion. And we have to, watch out for participating in that and instead say we see where you're going and we we will support you in the direction in which Ooh, you're I headed. I love that. That, 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 is dope, man. that is awesome. That is awesome. We talked about that behind That's the scenes. That's what I think the issue is. Because he's going to have a lot of those challenges, right? For and sure. It's going to test him as a coach. For sure. 100%. And like as a human being because he has been used. It's your Morehouse effect, you, right? Jay, like there it is, your Morehouse effect of yes. like, hey, I've had this supported community. Yeah naturally yeah. just because i am a black man and i'm at morehouse and that's what it was built f- not that's what it was built for but that's what comes with it yeah that was my experience he left jackson with the same kind of thing and yeah. now you went to brown yeah and now he's, he's going brown. to see you yep. like yep. one of the whitest places it happens in brown. a lot it and happens yeah a lot. absolutely the, the the newly hired but not yet begun president of harvard university is a black woman. Yes. Mm-hmm. Right? Yes. Yep. yep. The U.S. Supreme Court now contains, for the very first time, a black female justice. Mm-hmm. Right. right? Like, and we might say those are celebrations, but what has been happening in many of the conversations about those roles are forms of sabotage. And here's what it looks like. They put uh, Dr. Gay in the role of president at Harvard at the time in which Harvard is facing this affirmative action case with the Supreme Court. So they're going to put her black face in front of this institution so when they're doing the Supreme Court uh, case around affirmative action. Or um, Katanji Brown Jackson is on a Supreme Court that's stacked against her, so she's being scapegoated. Like, that's how people are attempting to spin it. Instead of saying, a school like Harvard probably would not hire a president to sabotage the institution. Yeah. That is not in the institution's best interest. Yes. The right. Supreme Court probably did not experience the onboarding of a black female so that Katanji Brown Jackson, Jackson can fail. That's probably not what they're doing. But when the context looks murky and the representative is someone who we might identify with and think that we've got a vested interest in their success, we might see those two things come together as a recipe for failure, like oh, the president of Harvard, they'll probably fire her out of the Supreme Court, decides that they participated in, they're eliminating affirmative action, and then she's out the door after two years. That's what we can expect. And that is the kind of self, my mom and I used to call it crabs in a barrel. Y'all probably yeah. heard that thing. Yeah, like, that's exactly that's what, what happens. Is. And I, th- I think that if, it, if we are capable of transcending that perspective, then we can celebrate the success, expect its goodness, and only look for good things to come out of it and not say, I told you so when it fails. I'm saying this to say, let's say next year, Boulder's record is like four. How many games do college football teams have? Uh, like 13. Depends. Yeah, so I'm going to say 12, 12 to meet y'all 12. in the middle. Yeah, so let's say if Boulder was three and nine this year, let's say next year they're four and eight. They were one in this past year. They won one game. So that's success though, so, right? So, so, so three is an upgrade. No, but that's why he came in was like, if y'all are cool with this, with winning one game, this, you're in the wrong place. Yeah. Because I have different expectations. Right. Now, a year from now, let, let's just say hypothetically, he wins one game. <laughs> and then they go, I told you so. This I told you point. so. Right? That's what you're talking this about. Point. But we should be wrapping our hands around him. Yeah, and saying it, this stuff takes time. Yeah, it takes time. And speaking of time, um, you brought the heat today, man. Heat. You brought yes. the heat. We heat. appreciate it. That's heat. good because it's like 27 outside. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you brought the heat. Yeah, man. Yeah. Warm up in here. And we hope you had uh, a great experience oh, on the fun. show. Yeah. And then, you know, in, in addition to that, um, you know, you have that Morehouse effect where you, again, you talked about like showing love and bringing each other up. Yeah. That's what we do here. Like we yeah. try to celebrate each I other. See that. 
And um, in the spirit of celebrating each other, there's some people that you have in your network that would probably shine on here. Um, who were, you know, one or two recommendations that you would throw out to come on here? Do you know Makisha Booth? Oh, that sounds familiar. She started an organization called Sister Biz. She's trying to help oh. black women start businesses and thrive. I've heard of Sister Biz, but I don't, but I don't, I don't know her. But I've heard of Sister Biz. Okay. Yeah, I think that's somebody to reach out to. I, I, I actually want to say, and this is not because of the journal. It's not a plug, but our chief writer, who's studying political science at Boulder, but who is a journalist, who's now our chief writer has one of the sharpest minds I think that you'll, you can encounter. And he can talk to you about, like, black politics. And it's, it's fresh. Uh, I think that might be somebody to bring on. What's his name? Alan Tellis. Okay. We can uh, give you some contact. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I yeah. saw it on the uh, website. I saw it. Yeah, she's brilliant. It's nice. Awesome. Funny stuff. Hey, respect, <clears throat> man. Real respect, talk. Respect, man. This was Definitely. Product today. Thank you, Antoine. Thank, Thank you for the welcome. patience, man. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> for our goose. Yeah. You sat through all that and still persevered and cooked. Cooked it. The chef. <laughs> cooked it. Yes. And you never stumble upon the unexpected if you stick to the familiar. So go out there, get educated, support DJEC, Denver Journal Education and Community. And we out. Yeah, yeah, yeah.